seated. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that in this kind of world we live in and with these kinds of bodies that we live in, that we can study um, a letter like Paul's letter to the Romans that just unfolds the gospel in all of its richness and depth. Because what we need more than anything in these bodies, in this world, is the gospel that reveals your righteousness, which we can only get through Jesus, through faith in him. So, Father, we pray that you would fortify each one here this morning in this gospel, that you would make it clear, uncover it, take the obstacles out of the path for each one of us, that we might see it and understand it more clearly so that we might have the very hope that we need in these bodies in this world, the hope of the gospel, that everyone who trusts in Christ alone is declared righteous in your sight on the basis of that faith. Oh, Father, we need the revelation of the righteousness of God that comes on the basis of faith that is revealed by the gospel. Help us. Help us to see it even more today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to take your Bible and let's open up to Romans this morning, Romans chapter 1. We've kind of uh, come to the end of the next section of Romans that we've been in. Paul's letter to the Romans is probably the richest and deepest unfolding of the gospel of Jesus Christ found in any one place in your New Testament. And this gospel argument is divided up into smaller subsections, and that's a really helpful thing for us, is when you take something long and deep, this long and deep gospel argument, and you divide it up into smaller bite-sized sections, it makes the whole maybe less intimidating. It helps us to swallow it one swallow at a time rather than trying to eat an elephant all at once. And the latest subsection of Romans that we've been in is the section that begins at chapter 2, verse 1, and it runs all the way to chapter 3, verse 20. And now that we've finished that section, I want to, again, like we've done in previous sections, I want to summarize it, and I want to put together some pastoral encouragements for you from that section. The benefit of doing it this way, of pausing every once in a while and summarizing each section is that we get to see then how it's tied back to the whole idea of the letter, the main idea of the letter. And again, we have that chance to make this very deep and thorough gospel argument more understandable to us along the way. Another benefit is, as some of you join us, um, you know, more recently, and you weren't here for the introduction of everything at the beginning, it gives you a chance to get a review of the whole as we go and tie the section that you came to Grace Bible Church in, and you get to tie it back to the main idea of the whole letter as well. So what I want to do first is I want to review the whole idea of the letter again, just briefly. So let's talk about number one, Romans as a whole. Remember, this letter is something of um, our, like one of our modern day missionary support letters that we receive. We love to receive missionary updates from the Dodds, from the Cans, from the Laymans in Papua New Guinea. I love getting updates from Massimo, who's in Italy. I enjoy getting updates from Wayman when he is off doing his training of leaders. Like he just went to the Philippines and there was unrest there and he's providing updates along the way. But Romans is a missionary support letter unlike any you've ever read from any present day missionary because of God's intent with the letter. God's intent with this missionary support letter is that it would be authoritative revelation of himself. It is a God-breathed missionary support letter, as you'll see again here. This is the Apostle Paul's um, missionary support letter to the church in Rome. It's AD 56 when he writes, Paul is finishing up his third missionary journey. And while he is in Corinth, he's thinking about Spain. 
to the west of Rome, to the west of Italy. Paul desires to take the gospel all the way there, and he sees the church that is in Rome as a crucial partner to help him take the gospel further than he's ever gone yet with it. What did he write to persuade them, to endear them to partner with him? Well, that's what this letter unfolds for us. So look over at Romans chapter 15. Verse 23, let me just remind you that this is what Paul is doing with this letter. Romans 15, verse 23, he says to the believers in Rome, he says, but now with no further place for me in these regions, meaning where he is at in the eastern Mediterranean, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you, believers in Rome, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Drop down to verse 28. I will go on by way of you, the church in Rome, to Spain. But this church in Rome is unique in the sense that it has not had any apostolic influence on it to help establish it. It did not have any direct influence or guidance from any one of the apostles. It wasn't planted by any one of them. It had no direct influence from an apostle. So before Paul partners with them in taking the gospel to Spain, he first wants to make sure that the church in Rome is well established in the gospel that he preaches. And what will establish them is the very same thing that will endear them to his gospel mission. It's the gospel. Now, if you can stay kind of in Romans 15 and go back to Romans chapter 1, let's look at the beginning and the end of Romans. Romans 1, verse 11. This is Paul's desire to establish them in the gospel. Look at this. Romans 1, verse 11. I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you so that you may be established. This is why he's writing. He wants them to be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So I want you to be established, and I want to preach the gospel to you. This is how it's going to happen. You will become established as I preach the gospel to you. Now, look at Romans chapter 16, verse 25. This is the end of the letter and Paul's benediction, his prayer for them. 16.25, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. You see, those are really the gospel-established bookends of the letter. And so everything that falls between chapter 1 and chapter 16 is the gospel in all of its richness and beauty and depth and power. Paul's belief is that in establishing them in the gospel that he preaches, that they will be endeared to that very gospel that they already have believed but they'll be endeared to it in such a way that they will want to help him get to Spain. They will want to see the gospel go to places that it is not yet reached. You see, being established in the gospel inevitably makes you want more and more people to know and believe the gospel. So our summary statement of the letter reflects this purpose for Paul's writing. I'll put it up on the screen for you. This is one way to summarize what the letter of Romans is really all about. The gospel will establish us, then endear us to the expansion of the gospel. So there are the three key words, establish, endear, and expand. This was Paul's intent with the letter in AD 56 when he wrote to the church in Rome. And its original purpose way back then needs to have an enduring impact upon us today even as we study it. These key words um, in regards to the gospel need to overtake each one of us and all of us corporately as a church to be established. You need to be established. I want to be established in the glorious truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Endeared. You must be endeared to it. I must be endeared to it in even greater ways than we already are. An expansion. 
I want to be endeared to the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a way that I can't be amazed at it all on my own. And you don't want to be amazed at it all on your own. You want increasing wider circles of people to hear the gospel who have never heard the gospel before. That's the effect this letter needs to have on us. So now that we've reviewed the summary of the letter, let's go secondly uh, to see Romans 1 through 320, the first basic three chapters of the, of the letter. Let's talk about where we've been and where we're headed. The first 15 verses of chapter 1, if you go back to chapter 1, introduced the Apostle Paul to us in two complementary ways. In chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, we're introduced to the, the Apostle Paul officially. He, he's never been there. They don't know him. And he's a, a, officially introducing himself there to them. What he says to them in verses 1 to 7, he could say anywhere to any church that he's been to. But in verses 8 to 15 of chapter 1, it's a more personal introduction of himself as an apostle. What he says in verses 8 to 15 of chapter 1, he could only say to the church in Rome because he's thinking about them. Upon fully introducing himself to the Romans there in verses 1 to 15, and we titled that section of it, The Apostle of Gospel Righteousness, Upon doing that, Paul goes really for the jugular and he just lays out the theme of his gospel interest in this letter. That takes us to the next very short section, but very powerful section, Romans 1, 16 to 17, which we titled The Revelation of Gospel Righteousness. Look at verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. Upon mentioning the gospel, Paul makes a beeline to talk about the righteousness of God. The gospel reveals that righteousness of God in some way in connection with faith. I encourage you to go back and you can listen to this sermon where we spent the whole time just unpacking what this meant. But what Paul means by this in shorter summary is that whenever a sinner believes the gospel, and it doesn't matter if they're a Jew or if they're a Greek, by that faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's righteousness gets revealed. The righteousness of God, that righteousness of God Um, is that which he gives to the believing one on the basis of faith alone. He declares over that sinner who believes a status of righteousness that the sinner did not have, but now he does have because God gave it to him, declared it over him on the basis of that sinner's faith alone in Jesus Christ. And so this is really the great theme of the letter, the justification of sinners by faith alone. That's what a missionary support letter is. It's Paul's missionary support letter, detailing this great gospel. And so this is why in every section of these titles, there will be some kind of a statement or a phrase connected with gospel righteousness or with unrighteousness or something like that. There's no other righteousness to be concerned with except this righteousness that is connected to the gospel that is revealed in the gospel whenever a sinner believes. It's God's righteousness. And so everything that flows from verse 17 in the letter on, of chapter 1, is written to make this case, and you have to be established in it. And when you are, you'll be endeared to it, and then you'll want to see it expand even more. That takes us to the next section, Romans 1, 18 to 32. We call that section the Gentiles of unrighteousness. This next section tells us the reason the righteousness of God is being revealed on the basis of faith alone, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. It is because God is revealing his wrath against unrighteous men everywhere that his righteousness is being revealed when one of them believes. Unrighteous man is propagating everywhere that he can his own unrighteousness. They're cheering each other on. Mankind is cheering each other on in his unrighteousness. And God is revealing his wrath everywhere on that unrighteousness. But God doesn't want his wrath to be revealed in such, doesn't just want his wrath to be revealed in such an unrighteous setting. He wants to reveal his righteousness also that is on the basis of faith. And so verses 19 to 23 prove that the wrath of God is deserved. 
man is truly unrighteous and he deserves wrath. And then in chapter 1, verses 24 to 32, it shows just exactly how God's wrath is being poured out right now. You have those three terrifying statements. God gave them over, verse 24. God gave them over, verse 26. And God gave them over, verse 28 of chapter 1. Those three statements um, are proof that God currently has humanity under his wrath. It's a shocking description that comes in verses 28 down to 32. Look at verse 32, how we're described. And although they, humankind, although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of the death sentence of God's judgment, although we know that, we not only do the same, but we also give hearty approval to those who practice these things. We cheer each other on in our unrighteousness. Do you notice what the good news begins with? Bad news. The gospel which reveals the righteousness of God through faith first must establish your unrighteousness and mine. And therefore, our need for God's righteousness. The gospel's first statement to make to you is that you are sinful and that you are under his wrath. That's the gospel's assessment of me. That's the gospel's assessment of you. But what do you think about that? How have you responded to that charge that you are under sin? That leads us to the next section that we have just been in as a church for many weeks, Romans 2, verse 1, all the way to 320. And we called that section the Jews of unrighteousness. I've made a minor adjustment in this title. If you have the original printout that um, I gave, it, I've, I've adjusted a little bit. I originally titled this section the Jews of works righteousness, but I really don't think that's what Paul is trying to combat in chapter 2 specifically. The Jews did try to work to establish their own righteousness, but the primary argument from this section, chapter 2 and most of chapter 3, is that the Jews saw themselves as exempt from that charge of being under sin, from the charge of being unrighteous. And therefore, if they were exempt from that, they were exempt from judgment. The Jews, for the most part, believed that they would not be judged by God, well, be because they're Jews. They were his people. They didn't see themselves as sinful and unrighteous as the rest, even though they practiced the very same sins, chapter 2, verse 1, and verse 3. They thought they wouldn't be judged because they were actually in agreement with God the judge about how sinful the rest of humanity was. Why would God judge them, along with everybody else, if they were on the same page with God about the judgment of the world? That's the argument, that's the thinking that's going on in the antagonist that Paul is confronting. That's especially what's going on in 2, 1 to 5. The Jew thought for sure that he wouldn't be judged by God because God saw the Jews as his favorites. That's what the Jew thought. And so God would be partial to the Jew. But the argument from Romans chapter 2, verse 6 to 11, if you look at it with me, is that God is completely impartial and he will judge every man on the basis of what he has done. Look at chapter 2, verse 6. He is the God who will render to each person according to his deeds. In verse 11, there is no partiality with God. The Jew and the Greek will have to both equally face an impartial God who judges. And the Jew thought that because he was privileged to have been surrounded by law, moral regulations and rules, and that because he had the privilege of the sign of circumcision, that he was secure before God. The wrong thought in the sinful Jew, remember he practices everything else that the rest of the world does, so the wrong thought in the sinful Jew was that his religious privileges provided security for him before God, a holy God. But that wasn't the case at all. Religious privileges call for responsibility. They do not provide security. That was the longer argument that Paul was making in Romans chapter 2, verse 12, all the way to verse 30, the end of that chapter. The Jew, to truly be 
a Jew as God defines a Jew meant that he needed to be made new from the inward heart level. He needed to be born again. He needed to be circumcised of heart, not of flesh. The Jew's view of his privileges never led him to think about his inward heart condition, unfortunately. And this particular Jew that Paul dialogued with in Romans chapter 2, he was an antagonistic, protesting Jew. He was, he was noisy in all of his protests regarding the charge of sin against him. So Paul, in chapter 3 then, verses 1 to 20, he circles back around to the charge of the gospel against all men, the, the charge that we are under sin, verse 9. Paul says, we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. That's our status. We are in an under sin condition, under the reign of sin, and therefore under the wrath of God. And, and there does happen to be anyone, in case there's somebody who thinks that he's exempt from the charge, the gospel strategy here is to remove that wrong thinking. So Paul circles back around, he presses this again to finally silence anybody who would protest. Chapter 3, verse 19 so that, all, um, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. So this is really what chapter 2, verse 1 through 320 is all about. And you notice the strategy of the gospel that Paul's laying out. So Paul's not, I've, told, I've said this before, Romans isn't just giving you the content of the gospel. Romans unfolds the strategy for how Paul preached the gospel, and dealt with protests along the way. First, the gospel is there to establish that all of us are under sin. This is the strategy. We're all under sin. And then if there happens to be anyone who thinks that he's exempt from that, the gospel strategy is to not let him slither away, but instead to keep laboring diligently before him to bring him into silent agreement with the charge against him that he is under sin. That's verse 19, to close every mouth. Why does the gospel labor to do this? Because then and only then is the sinner really ready to hear that salvation is not by anything you can do. Don't try to add works to your life. Believe Christ. Believe Christ. Then and only then will you stop any effort to lift yourself out of your own status of under sin or to try to lift yourself up into a status of righteousness. Only then will you be led to the next section, which we will get into in July in a couple of weeks here, Romans 3, verses 21 to 31, the faith of gospel righteousness. So the last 11 verses of chapter 3 bring us back to Paul's great gospel declaration in Romans 1, 16 to 17. Let me show you this. If you look back at chapter 1, verse 17, it says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. And then look over at Romans 3, 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. So it's revealed through faith, and it's revealed not on the basis of law. Faith and belief are mentioned in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, and faith and belief are mentioned in Romans chapter 3, verse 22. And Romans 1, 16, it's the Jew is mentioned, and then the Greek is mentioned. And in verse 22 of chapter 3, there's no distinction. It doesn't matter who you are, if you're Greek or Jew. What's the point? In this next section that we're going to be headed into, sinners are ready to hear how faith is their only hope when they are brought into silent agreement with the charge of the gospel against them, that they are indeed under sin and incapable on their own of finding any way out from under their under sin status. And we'll explore more of that when we get to that section. Now, let me give you in our last bit of time together the pastoral encouragement from the section that we've been in. Number three, pastoral encouragement. What I want to do is I want to string together some key gospel realities for you from chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to 320. We'll call it gospel realities that those under sin must face. And so maybe you can think of your own life this morning if you have faced these gospel realities yet. Number one, 
I am easily deceived that I am on a higher moral ground than others. This is where the antagonist in Romans chapter 2 that Paul is confronting began. Remember in chapter 2 verse 1, it says that he practiced the same things. It says the same thing in, chapter, in verse 3 of that chapter. Um, he practices the same things that the rest do who are all under the wrath of God, but he deceived himself into thinking that he was on some higher moral ground than them and than the rest, and so therefore he was even qualified to judge them. And you see, that's the way indwelling sin always works in you and in me and in this antagonist in Romans 2. Rather than seeing ourselves as being on the same level as everybody else, and especially rather than seeing ourselves as worse than others, what do we do? How do we see ourselves? We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt above everybody else. We think far too highly of ourselves and are quick to be overly concerned about the splinters in other people's eyes while there's a log coming out of our own. And in that deplorable condition, when we sit and we hear somebody say that the gospel charges mankind as being under sin, we go, that's right. Everybody out there is. And we don't think about ourselves. We claim an exemption because we have deceived ourselves into thinking we are on higher moral ground. Do you see any of that tendency within you? It's there. It's in me, I know. The second gospel reality I must face is this. Number two, just because I don't want to be judged doesn't mean I'm repentant. Just because I don't want to be judged doesn't mean I'm repentant. The antagonist in Romans 2 thought there was no way that he would be judged because he was in agreement with God about the sinfulness of the rest of mankind. I mean, he hoped that his own judgment of the rest, that, that God would see it and see that God has an ally. God has a peer out there concerning judgment. He has a partner. He has a like-minded judicial official. Romans 2, verse 3, but do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things, but do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? You see, he doesn't want to be judged by God. But what was interesting about this antagonist who doesn't want to be judged was that at the same time, he didn't think highly of God's kindness that leads to repentance. Verse 4, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. So beware of this very strange and dangerous condition within. Just because someone doesn't want to be judged, just because somebody doesn't want to go to hell, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are ready to turn from their sin. This is how sin works in you and in me. Sin doesn't like the idea of being judged. And sin looks for every possible way to exempt itself from the charge of sin and from judgment. Sin hates judgment. But it equally hates it when you want to turn from it too. So sin is happy if you hate being judged by God as long as you also simultaneously hate repenting of your sin. That's a dangerous condition to be in. Has this gospel reality hit you? Don't take comfort in the fact that you don't want to be judged. I mean, kids, I mean, can you... Do you want to be caught by your parents when you do something wrong? No, but that doesn't mean that you want to do what's right. We need to be aware of this within us. Third gospel reality you need to face. Number three, only the gospel prepares me for judgment, which is on the basis of deeds. Judgment is on the basis of what a man does. That's how God will assess every man. He will render to everyone according to what he has done. And only the gospel prepares you for that judgment. And we spent a couple of Sundays trying to think rightly about what the Bible says about how God judges all men. As I said, he judges all on the basis of what they have done. Romans chapter 2, verse 6. He will render to each person according to his deeds. Verses 7 through 10 is one of several passages in the New Testament that details what that judgment of all men looks like. For some, the judgment is favorable in that section, and for the rest, it is unbearably horrible. 
And only the gospel prepares me for that judgment where God will render to me what I have done. How? First, the gospel saves me. And we have to leave chapter 2 to establish this because in in chapter 2, Paul isn't prepared to go through all of this. He's not prepared to talk about how the gospel saves yet. He just states the fact of judgment and he just leaves it hanging there and it leaves you clawing for something to hang on to. Well, how does anybody face judgment and pass? But we had to comfort ourselves with the rest of the New Testament, what it says. And here's how the gospel prepares you for that day when God will give to you on the basis of what you have done. First, the gospel saves me on the basis of faith alone, quite apart from any works that I do. The gospel tells me that my sin and my guilt have been taken away from God's sight. The gospel tells me that my penalty for sin has been paid by Jesus when he shed his blood at the cross in my place. And the gospel tells me that his wrath, therefore, against me has been satisfied. It is Christ's work that saves me, not mine, I believe with the gift of faith that he comes and brings, and and I'm saved by the power of God in the gospel. That's how the gospel begins to prepare me for judgment day. Secondly, the gospel tells me that every evil deed I have ever done against God has therefore been what? Forgiven. All because of Christ. He's the one who bore every single one of my evil deeds that I ever did. He bore it in his body on the cross, and God crushed him on the cross with my evil deed upon him, and I am forgiven. I never have to worry about judgment for that evil deed again. There is no condemnation because of my union with Christ. But listen very carefully. That does not mean that God will not render to me according to what I've done. He will. So then how does the gospel prepare me for that? Thirdly, the gospel has transformed me through the new birth. I am a new creation in Christ, and the gospel equips me in that brand new condition to do the good works that God has prepared for me to walk in. Ephesians 2.10, we are the workmanship of of Christ, right? We're created in Christ Jesus for good works, the works that he prepared for us to walk in. In fact, what we find out in Titus chapter 2, verse 14, is that we are even zealous now in Christ through the gospel to do good works. And this is all because of Christ. So my life is to be marked by doing good deeds all because of the gospel's work in my own life. I have been perfectly set up for judgment day. Therefore, when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I've been well prepared by the gospel for that very moment because every evil deed I have ever done has already been what? Pardoned forgiven because of Christ's death in my place, and now every good deed that I have ever done, which came from God, that he gave for me to do, now I'm rewarded for doing that which he gave me to do. We are the only ones, those of us who believe Jesus Christ, those of us saved by the gospel, we are the only ones ready to stand before judgment one day. And the Bible calls it judgment. But our judgment has been transformed, has it not? Everything evil that I did, forgiven. Everything good that I've done, rewarded. And everything else that is not sin or is not a good deed is burned up. 1 Corinthians 3. If you want to write the verses down again, the passages, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 to 15. These are the passages on the judgment of believers which is a judgment unto rewards. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 10. And Romans 2, verses 7 to 10. Our judgment has truly been transformed into something very different than the judgment of those who are not in Christ. So, only the gospel prepares me for judgment, which is on the basis of deeds. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? 
Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, you did well. That's judgment for the believer, a judgment unto rewards. Fourth, the fourth gospel reality I must face, God will judge me personally and impartially. Romans 2, 6 makes it clear that judgment will not be a group evaluation. You won't be able to hide in the crowd. You won't be able to blend in. Verse 6, he will render to each person, one at a time, one at a time, one at a time, according to his deeds. And Romans 2, 11 makes it clear that God will not take bribes. He will not take payoffs. He will not be persuaded, though you had special religious privileges. He is holy. He is unwavering in his standard of righteousness. He will not deviate from his standard when you face him in judgment. Verse 11, there is no partiality with God. Judgment before him will be personal, one at a time, and it will be impartial. And the gospel makes us ready for that. Have you faced this reality? What are you hoping in? The fifth gospel reality that I must face is merely possessing law as one under sin provides no hope. This better not be one of your hopes. Merely possessing law as one who has a status by the gospel as being under sin, that provides you no hope. It's a horrible thing to hope in when the gospel tells you that you are under sin and under judgment. Adding rules to your under sin condition will make absolutely no difference at judgment. If we learned anything from Romans 2, it should be to place no hope in the mere external addition of moral religious rules to an under sin condition. But people do this. The gospel tells us we're all under sin and wrath, and so some try to exempt themselves from that judgment by foolishly adding religious rules to their lives. Romans 2 verse 12, all who have sinned, all who are sinners by category, who are in law, who are within the reach of law, they'll be judged. Chapter 2, verse 23, you who boast being in law, you've got a law surrounding you. Through your breaking it, do you dishonor God? There's no hope. Listen, growing up in a religious setting, whether you're a Jew in the first century in Paul's day or whether you're a Christian kid at Grace Bible Church, that presents a unique challenge. As long as you are under sin and you're, you're in that under sin status and it remains unchanged, adding any Christian rules to your life, Christian do's and Christian don'ts, it will never exempt you from judgment. The gospel strategy is to take this false assurance away from you that you just have got some good rules. You've got some good teaching. You've got some good uh, guiding, guiding principles in your life. Has the gospel done this in you? And I'll ask, especially you younger ones, has the gospel done this? Has it taken away this false assurance that you've just got good things around you and you're okay? The sixth gospel reality I must face. Don't worry, there's only 23 of them. We're almost a fourth of the way through. <laughs> I'm kidding, there's eight. We're getting close. Number six, religious privileges require responsibility. They do not provide security. What if you've grown up in the middle of good religious rules and other privileges? That was the Jew in the first century that Paul faced in every synagogue that he went to. They had all grown up in great privilege. They, the Jew grew up in a nation full of religious privilege. They, they had the scriptures. They had circumcision. They had Mosaic law. And those things in and of themselves are not bad things at all. They were all given to that nation by God. Paul and the gospel affirmed that, that these were God-given religious privileges. But what the gospel makes you face, however, is the twisted way that your indwelling sin abuses those good privileges. The Jews wrongly thought that their privileges provided security for them, but they were still in their under sin status before the judge, and they were practicing everything else that all the unrighteous around them were doing. God gave them those privileges that they might take responsibility with them and use those privileges to help them see their need 
um, for, for God's righteousness, to see their own unrighteousness, to see God's loving kindness towards them, that he would save them by faith alone in him. Listen, to be a Christian kid growing up in all things Christian, you have Christian parents, you have Christian siblings, you have student ministries at your church, you're, you're schooling in maybe a very Christian setting, it's a homeschool environment or it's a, a Christian school, you've got Christian music, you've got exemplary parents, you've got a church to come to, you have tremendous religious privileges that a lot of kids don't have. I didn't grow up with any of those things. But those privileges are there in your life, kids. Listen carefully. They're there not for you to conclude that you are exempt or secure before God at judgment. Instead, those religious privileges require from you responsibility. Use them. Use the word of God. Use the gospel. Use your parents and their counsel. Use student ministries. Use summer camp. Use good books. Use good Christian music to help you see your own unrighteousness. Use those things to help you see your need for a Savior. Use those things to help you see your need for faith alone in Jesus Christ. Students, where are you with this? gospel reality, that religious privileges require responsibility from you. They do not provide security for you. Seventh gospel reality, number seven, sin teaches me to vigorously protest both the gospel message and its messengers. If Romans 2 to 3 drove anything home to us, it was how this under sin condition hates to be called out as such. This under sin condition is a whiner condition when called out by the gospel. As Paul was walking us down this gospel path, this part of it, protests were breaking out. Antagonism was at every step. There were objections and exemptions and exemptions cluttering the gospel path. We didn't even know where we could take another step. Inventions of evil were being hurled against God and the gospel and even Paul. That was chapter three, verses one to eight. If left to ourselves in this under sin condition that's described When the gospel calls us out, we're like cockroaches in the middle of the night. Turn the light on, and they run from the light, and they look for darkness. We hate the light. We hate what it just did to disrupt our darkness. And so we scurry away from the light because we are, as Romans 1 verse 30 says, we are haters of God. And he just called me out. Have you noticed this yet about yourself? Christians, that was us, was it not? Wasn't that you at one point? And this is what the gospel mission requires for us to do on the gospel mission trail, to turn the light on for those who are in an under sin condition. Now, we tell them a whole lot more than this too, don't we? We get to tell them about how Jesus Christ secured a pardon for every single rebel who believes. But listen, there are many protests and there are many exceptions that are claimed along the way when we tell people that you're a sinner. Slanderous things get said. We get mocked. God gets mocked, more importantly. And that's Romans chapter 3, verse 9 to 18. Paul circles back around and he, he makes the charge again that all are under sin. But in that hostile setting called the gospel mission, where there's protests, God saves some, doesn't he? He saves some guilty rebels. And aren't we, the, aren't we living proof? Aren't we living proof of this? And that leads us to the last gospel reality to face Well, which guilty ones are saved? Number eight, only when I am brought into silent agreement with the gospel will I trust Jesus Christ. Which guilty ones are saved along the gospel's path? The guilty ones who are done protesting. The guilty ones who are done throwing rocks. The guilty ones who are done hurling abuses at God. God. 
and his messengers, the guilty ones whose mouths have been closed. Chapter 3, verse 19. So that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. The guilty ones who are saved are those who have been thoroughly convinced of their under sin status before God. And they have no more interest in protesting him or the charge such that they do not desire to do anything foolish like trying to add rules to their life. Verse 20, by works of the law, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. All adding rules did to the one who's under sin is just reveal more sin. I see it. Tell me to not do something and I want to do it. Only the guilty one whose mouth has been closed by the gospel is the one for whom the gospel will open the mouth again so that faith can be put in Jesus Christ. You must confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, but that comes only after the gospel closed your mouth in protest against him. Is that you yet? Has the gospel closed your mouth full of protests against him? Has the gospel reopened your mouth to profess faith in Jesus Christ? To say, I trust in Jesus alone to save me from my sin and from God's wrath. Because we've gone a little longer, we're just gonna close in prayer and we won't sing again. If you want, you can sing in the car on the way home. Put a good song on. Do it as a family. Dad, I expect you to lead your family in that. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the letter that Paul wrote to the Romans that is in our Bibles. It is so important to understand the gospel, what it is, what its content is, but it's also really, really important to understand how it must be used to bring a guilty one into agreement with you. Only you can do that, God. I can't bring anybody into agreement with it. Paul couldn't bring them into agreement with it. Paul had to trust that as he laid the gospel out clearly and strongly, that your spirit was present also, working in the hearts of those that you would save. Oh God, give us greater confidence to proclaim this gospel. And may our confidence not be in us that we understand the gospel, we understand its strategy, but may our confidence be in, in you and in your power to save. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now to fortify us as a church, establish us in this gospel, endear us more and more to it, that we might see it expand more and more. And Lord, even this morning, expand it into a heart here that has been fighting against you, dragging his or her feet. Father, press into their heart. Help them to see that they must have you be gracious to them and give them the very faith so that they can trust in Jesus and be declared righteous in your sight. God, do for them even now what you have done for so many of us. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.